afternoon or good morning, everyone. What a wonderful video to start with uh, today, our applying to a UK Russell Group University webinar. My name is Tvetelina and on behalf of SRT, I would like to thank everyone who chose to watch that webinar on a Saturday, especially if your day sun is like mine. Uh, I promise you it will be totally worth your time because here today we have three wonderful very knowledgeable admissions officers from three top universities. We have Stephen Soans from University of Warwick. We have Caroline Singer of University of Manchester and Cecilia Valdenea from University of Southampton. Guys, are you here? I would like to formally welcome you and learn more about Russell Group and your institutions. Hi, Stephen. Hello um, and welcome everyone. It's nice to see so many of you all writing in the chat already. Um, lovely to see you all today. Welcome Caroline and we have Cecilia joining as well. Hello everybody, thank you for joining us today. I hope you find the information we're providing useful and please let us know if you have any questions. Cecilia, am I right that it's really early in the morning for you or definitely not an afternoon? You're based in Mexico City, aren't you? Yeah, I just got here two days ago, so it's my 9 a.m. Oh, well, good morning. I see people in the chat also watching us from all over. Can you hear uh, me well? We do, yeah. You're great. Um, I would like to invite all our, um, all our viewers today uh, to um, ask us any questions during the webinar in the chat, which you can uh, see on the right-hand side of your screen. I see a lot of you are saying hello. Beatriz from Mexico, hola and buenos dias. And uh, in this chat, we will be uh, sharing with you the prospectuses of the universities. We'll sharing with you uh, useful links and any questions you may have to our three presenters today please post them here. We will make sure to answer at the end. So without further ado, I will pass the word to Stephen, who will talk about Russell Group. What is Russell Group? And then we'll continue with um, the rest of the presentation. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So in this first section, I'm going to introduce the Russell Group, uh, which is a term you may have heard of. Uh, quite often we get compared to the Ivy League in the US. Uh, I'm very briefly, in about 10 minutes, going to take you through what it means to be a Russell Group University uh, and actually why it might be significant to you when you're making choices about which universities to choose uh, to study in. To start with, and I can see you all using the chat, uh, it's great to see so many of you uh, from so many different countries, from Mexico, Ecuador, Venezuela, uh, Uzbekistan, Albania and various places. So welcome everybody. Uh, first off, I want to start with a question to see how many Russell Group universities you know. Uh, so I'm going to give you about 30 seconds from now to write in the chat as many different Russell Group universities as you know. Uh, there are 24 answers. We've got an answer already. So Cambridge, Sheffield, that's two already. Southampton is three. Manchester's four. Bristol's five. Uh, yes, brilliant. This is fantastic. Liverpool, Oxford, Leeds, uh, Exeter, Warwick. Thank you for mentioning us. Uh, UCL, absolutely. Uh, there are 24 of them. Uh, we've got Bath in there, Durham, Imperial. Fantastic. Glasgow, yes. Uh, Interesting, we've got Yale mentioned. Uh, we'll come to Yale in just a moment. Um, Exeter, yes, York. Uh, we've got Westminster in there. Uh, thank you very much. We haven't got too long, so I'm going to move on uh, and just show you. I've got Birmingham there. Uh, these are those 24 universities. So I think collectively, uh, the power of hive knowledge here, you've actually gone and got most of them. Um, there are some that are surprises that are not part of the Russell Group, and some of these may include universities like Bath. Uh, we're often associated as being part of a similar type of university. Uh, Lancaster would be a similar one that's not part of the Russell Group formally. Uh, but you've got many of these other ones. I think most of these have been mentioned. Uh, and you can see from these images, they look very different in many cases uh, from very modern universities, uh, such as Warwick. We are one of those modern universities. Uh, York is the same, right the way through to much older universities, such as uh, Manchester, who's here with us today, uh, UCL, and of course, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, many others. There are 24 of us, um, and we are quite varied. So not just in terms of being city versus campus, not just in terms of our age, 
but also in terms of our size, uh, sizes ranging from 12,000 to 41,000 students, so quite big in some cases. We tend to be quite selective in terms of applications, so we don't just accept anybody who applies. We take a very rigorous ap approach to admissions. And then if you compare this with the Ivy League, you can see some similarities and some differences. So there are more of us in the Russell Group. We are more spread out across the country that we inhabit. So we are from Scotland right down to the very far south coast of England, uh, Southampton being one of those on the south coast. Warwick is right in the middle. Uh, and Manchester's in the sort of the north middle part of the UK. And then there are slight differences in terms of that application process. So when you apply to a Russell Group University in the UK, you tend to apply for a specific degree or subject. Through UCAS, you'll apply for up to five universities, but you're making a case for a particular discipline in most cases. The Ivy League is more of a broader statement of purpose, more of a positioning of yourself uh, as a thinker and as a, uh, a person generally. It's not just about the academics. Uh, and the US and the UK have some slight differences in terms of uh, optionality and flexibility. Uh, but as I'll come on to, flexibility is very much part of Russell Group universities. Just to show you graphically what the Russell Group is, uh, we are very research focused. So you can see from this that less than one fifth of UK universities are Russell Groups. Only one quarter of students are Russell Group students, but a full two thirds of the UK's world leading research happens at our 24 universities. Now, research is something that academics do, but it's something that our undergraduate students do as well in many of our universities. So it is directly relevant in terms of the experience you can gain, particularly if you want to go on to academic careers. But more than that, it means that our universities are giving you direct uh, links to the world leading research that's happening right now. So the very latest research is happening under your roof with your academics that are teaching you. So there's an immediacy between new discovery and learning at a Russell Group University, very much in the same way that an Ivy League university will give you for the US. That flexibility comes through in the number of degree pathways we have. We tend to be larger universities with uh, typically on average 300 different bachelor pathways. And as I've said, you get opportunities for research at quite a young age. So within the UK, Russell Group Universities will give you a chance often to take an experiential project, uh, both within your academic course as part of your undergraduate degree, uh, so a dissertation or a, a science lab project, what might be called a capstone project in the US. But also over the summer, you can get paid research projects uh, linked to academics. Uh, who will supervise your project a bit like a mini PhD. That flexibility is inherent in how we teach, so you can look at single honours, joint honours, or multidisciplinary degrees. Uh, many of our universities teach liberal arts, uh, subjects like global sustainable development that don't sit neatly in any one box, but nevertheless answer big real-world questions. We tend to have a mix of critical theory, so this tends to be on the theoretical uh, side of things, and practice. We always put critical theory in to degrees, uh, I think pretty much across the, the board for Russell Group Universities, because it means that you get into the mechanics of your subject. You're not just a doer, you're not just there being practical and getting out there being a photographer or a fashion designer, uh, or somebody who can fix uh, automotive uh, devices. You are somebody who understands the mechanism and the process behind it. So you're a deep thinker, and we want to teach you to be a deep thinker that understands the fundamentals of whatever subject you're taking, whether that's politics, business, engineering, medicine, uh, to then go and be a practitioner who is fully rounded uh, in all of those skill sets. We tend to have small group teaching, and you can see here that the average university in the Russell Group has a ratio of 13 students to one academic normally. Uh, it's 1 to 15 in the top 50 non-Russell Group universities, uh, and outside the top 50, the class sizes would tend to be bigger still. 
I won't talk about this too much because we haven't got too much time and I want to leave uh, space for questions. Uh, but you can see that we are very complex organisations with uh, lots of facilities, lots of collections, and not just on the academic side, but also in terms of the social side, uh, typically between one to 300 student-led societies, uh, dozens of sports clubs, uh, and lots of facilities uh, that are part of our infrastructure. This uh, is uh, University of Manchester um, academic who has now just this month become the chair of the Russell Group. And you can see in this positioning statement that she released earlier this month, uh, that the teaching and the research that the Russell Group universities that we're part of manage are interlinked. So re research isn't just for academics, it's not just for people later in their career, but it feeds directly through to the BSc and the BA degrees uh, that we all teach at our universities. Finally, and this is my last slide, uh, we have employability uh, at our core. Uh, we are, as I've said already, selective on admissions, and we then want you to succeed all the way through. So that once we've accepted you, and it's a rigorous process to be accepted at a Russell Group University, we will then support you every step of the way, and that includes uh, with guidance. Um, and you'll see 23 out of those 25 universities uh, are Russell Groups amongst the top most targeted. I'm going to hand over now, and you had a little sneak preview there of uh, Caroline's slides. Uh, so Caroline is going to present now uh, for University of Manchester. I'll just hand over to you, Caroline. Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline and I work for the University of Manchester. Thanks very much for joining today. So what I'm going to talk to you about is student life at Russell Group University. So what that entails both inside and outside of the classroom, what your different options are, and how this might be able to help you narrow down your search in preparing to apply. So the first thing to say, and Stephen has alluded to this already, is that it's not just one type of degree that we offer at Russell Group Universities. So for most universities within the UK, with, a, with the exception of some small private universities, you'll apply through UCAS and how this process works in practice will be explained later in the presentation by Cecilia. But depending on what you are interested in studying, there may be different types of qualifications available. So the main difference at undergraduate level will be aiming for a bachelor's degree or an undergraduate master's degree. And depending on what you are studying and how you've chosen to study it, degrees in England will typically take between three to five years to complete. There are some subjects that you can either study as a humanities subject or a science. So key examples here include geography with human geography related degrees normally offering a BA or an MA qualification and physical geography uh, degrees offering a BSc um, or an undergraduate master's option and psychology with the BA being a more social science led subject and the BSc offering a more kind of scientific or clinical background. And likewise, engineering can offer both BEng and MEng options, the key difference here being whether or not an undergraduate research project is involved. So our best recommendation is to use the UCAS website as your starting point. It has a really useful course directory, which will allow you to explore some of your options. Other key options to tailor your degree can include an industrial placement, which is also sometimes called an internship, various other titles like professional experience, year in industry, placement year, sandwich year, etc., or study abroad. So with regards to that internship year, this can be a really valuable experience, both for vocational and non-vocational degrees. Some of these courses will have their own UCAS codes, so you can apply for them as an option from the outset, but it can also be possible to transfer onto this kind of course once you've started your studies, provided that you've achieved certain grades. Your internship could be within the UK, it could be within your home country, or it could be somewhere else entirely. And if you have a network of friends and family who are able to help you source an internship, you can apply to your university to have that approved as your internship option. Or you can use our network as the university through your academics, through the career service to help you source an internship as well. So you have both options open to you. But if you know that gaining practical or hands on experience will be an important part of the university experience for you, then you can use this as one of your criteria to help you narrow down your choices when you're applying through UCAS. Another option is to undertake a period of study abroad as an undergraduate student. Most universities will have an exchange programme. There are sometimes some limitations to study abroad. Typical examples would include engineering and medicine due to the nature of the programme. 
But for most programmes, you have a couple of different options when it comes to study abroad. You can either have this as a credit bearing part of your degree, depending on what and where you're studying. So your marks from your host university count towards your qualification from your home university, or it could be an extra period of time where your marks in your host university don't count towards your final degree, but you will still be expected to pass the year. And that's typically the case for the longer year abroad type placements. And similar to the internship year, some courses will have their study abroad as a separate UCAS code, so you can apply for that option from the outset. Whereas in other cases, you'll be able to either opt in or apply to study abroad once you've started your studies. When it comes to postgraduate degrees, um, completing a master's degree in the UK, for example, offers a number of advantages to students. So compared to some other geographies, it can be a much more intensive course, which is completed quicker. And this can allow significant cost savings, both in terms of tuition fees and other costs such as accommodation. And you can also start your career faster. And again, here you have options to tailor your degree, either study abroad or work placement. But again, these are normally mutually exclusive, particularly because the programme of a master's degree in the UK is just so jam packed. But the typical qualification that you will emerge with will be an MSc, both for um, sciences and humanities. But for humanities, MA qualifications are also widely available. Other top postgraduate qualifications include LLM, so Master of Laws. MBA, MED, Masters of Education and MMUS. Not all qualifications are obviously offered for all subjects in all universities, so it's important to research what is offered by each university and what kind of qualification you would be completing before you apply. Lots of students choose to complete a master's in a field that is related to their undergraduate degree, so they can be further enhancing their knowledge, deepening their level of specialisation, but it's also possible to do something which you might call a conversion master's, so that's open to a student of any degree discipline who's interested in retraining into a more vocational subject. And key examples here include law and surveying. So if changing career tracks is something that you might be interested in, then you can check the entry requirements for each of the programmes on the websites of the universities that you're interested in. And here you'll find if there are any restrictions or application criteria. So if prior specialist knowledge is a prerequisite. And when it comes to postgraduate research degrees, the typical qualification that you'll emerge with here is obviously a PhD or a doctorate. Um, but there's other qualifications available as well, including an MRes, Masters by Research, MPhil, Masters of Philosophy, as well as other programmes such as collaborative or professional engineering enterprise doctoral programmes. So a postgraduate research degree in the UK typically involves a really high level of autonomy from the outset. It's quite self-directed and you will be undertaking truly independent research under the guidance of your supervisor. Another option within the UK is to undertake a doctoral training programme. So although you will still ultimately emerge with a postgraduate research qualification, undertaking a doctoral training programme also involves some taught elements such as training and research skills. So moving on now to talk about funding. So every year, hundreds of thousands of students from all around the world join a Russell Group University. Attending a Russell Group allows you to access some of the world's leading academics, um, have access to the very best teaching and research facilities and be part of an elite but not elitist academic community. And correspondingly, fees at the Russell Group universities tend to be a little bit higher than their non-research intensive counterparts. So fees start from just under £17,000 for some Russell Group universities and can be as much as £35,000 per year for undergraduate students. Some courses will have different bandings, depending on whether they're mostly classroom based or if they have a significant element of laboratory or clinical training, with the latter two being a little bit more expensive. For example, fees for the clinical years at uh, Russell Group Universities can be up to £47,000. But tuition fees cover the full university experience from registration, tuition supervision, examinations right through to graduation. And they also allow you to access all of your university's facilities, such as libraries, study spaces and specialist academic spaces too. Many Russell Group universities offer scholarships and bursaries to international students, and these might be based on academic excellence. So, for example, achieving top grades in high school or in your undergraduate degree, your home domicile or another criterion such as extracurricular achievements. But you may find that most Russell Group universities um, offer a partial, partial scholarship to students. This is much more common than the full scholarship model, which is prevalent in the US and North America. What this means in practice is that you're going to need to be able to uh, fund the balance of your tuition fees if you are awarded a scholarship or a bursary, whether that is independently or via sponsorship. 
And in many cases, the scholarships and bursaries are awarded competitively. So not everyone who applies for one will receive it. So what you might also want to investigate is other third parties, such as the British Council, who can help you with your scholarship and bursary research. So my last slide is um, talking about the kind of wider student experience and some of the student support that's available in Russell Group universities. So coming to a UK university is um, the student experience side of things is one of the main things that attracts students apart from the academics. Attending a university in the UK can be really different to how things are in your home country. So, for example, it might be common uh, where you're from to go to university in your own town or city and continue living with family. Whereas in the UK, even for students who live here, it's really common to travel uh, across the whole length of the country for your studies. So what this will mean is that you'll meet students from all over the UK, as well as students from diverse nationalities. And this mix of people, both inside your classroom and on campus, tends to mean that the university experience in the UK is much more all encompassing. So it spills over into your social life as well as your studies. And socialising with your course mates, your housemates and other students is really common and really enriches the overall student experience. Another key difference uh, of degrees in the UK is the level of independence that you have right from the outset of your studies from undergraduate through to PhD. And you'll be spending several hours each week undertaking private study alongside any taught elements of your courses. So this might include reading a chapter from one of your textbooks. It might be preparing a presentation to deliver in a seminar, revising lecture notes or preparing for an exam. But what we suggest to students is that you treat studying at university in the UK like a full time job. So typically devoting between 35 and 40 hours per week to your studies. So for most top courses, you'll have between 12 and 20 hours of contact time. And this means that you'll be doing between 20 and 28 hours of private study, typically. As an independent learner at university, you will have access to a wide range of facilities, including your university's main library, any on campus study spaces, as well as departmental libraries and specialist facilities like computing labs, workshops and studios, depending on what you're studying. But these spaces are not only reserved for academics at Russell Group universities, you have access to a range of equipment and spaces from first year of undergrad onwards. And while we do expect you to take responsibility for your own learning, we also support you at every step of the way. So you have your own academic advisor who will be able to um, help you choose top modules for one of our top courses or a supervisor if you're a PhD student and they'll guide you through your academic program. And most academics in the UK have an open door policy, so you can just email them about something that you're struggling with, or maybe they have a dedicated slot each week where you can just drop by to talk to them about something to do with your course. And in this way, it's much more approachable and much more informal than some other universities in different parts of the world. You may also have access to a peer mentor, a student who's studying the same subject as you, but who's at a later stage in their degree. Um, and again, that presents another informal opportunity to talk about the academic side of your course. There's also a really strong focus on employability and um, career planning in Russell Group universities, again, both within and outside of the classroom. So, for example, in some taught degrees, you will have either a module or an element of a module that might be delivered by a careers advisor professional or an outreach member of staff from uh, a local national or international firm and helping you to develop those kinds of skills that will help make you a more rounded individual alongside your academic knowledge. Um, so finally, just to um, conclude, I will say that um, the student experience is a really, really important part of studying at a Russell Group University, both for UK and international students. And our aim is to give you access to high quality teaching and student experiences that will help you grow both academically and personally, ultimately making you a more rounded individual. Um, so with that, I will um, introduce Cecilia to talk about how to apply to a Russell Group University. The introduction. So my name is Cecilia Valdene and I'm the representative of the University of Southampton in Latin America. So if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to help you in the application process or any questions you might have. Um, so yeah, I will briefly discuss about how to apply to a Russell Group University, the application process through UCAS, the undergraduate application process, postgraduate um, application process, documents that you will need in order to apply, 
um, admissions and entry requirements. So um, UCAS is a website, it's an online platform that is uh, used to apply for undergraduate uh, programs in the UK for British universities. It's a selective admissions process. Um, it's just one application. You upload your documents to this uh, platform and this application can be sent directly to five different universities. Um, we do not know uh, as a university which other options you've applied. Options. Um, there are some restrictions. Uh, let's say if you're starting, if you're thinking about applying to medicine, veterinary science, dentistry, you can only apply to four options instead of five. And if you're thinking about applying to Oxford or Cambridge, you can either apply to one or the other one. So those are some restrictions. In all the other courses, you can apply to five different universities with the same documents. So all your documents are uploaded to UCAS, the UCAS portal and you can track your application through this website you create a login account and you can keep track of uh, what the results are going to be uh, directly on this port um, on this portal so the app the application is reviewed by the admissions team and usually the course tutors and most programs do not have an interview there are some courses uh, such as medicine and dentistry that do require uh, an interview uh, in order to pr uh, process the application. So I will go and talk about key dates for UCAS and the undergraduate admissions process. So applications um, are open on UCAS starting the 6th of September. And um, the deadline to apply for Oxford and Cambridge and medicine courses is the 15th of October. This is because there are some interviews carried out in, in January. So the the admissions team meets, um, meets this time to process the application and um, arrange the interviews for January and February for the medicine courses. The 15th of January is the UK deadline. Um, that means that there's equal consideration if you apply by the state. It does not make a difference if you apply a month before or by the 15th of January. Um, after this date, you can still apply, but uh, you, it will not be considered for clearing um, up. So what are um, the admissions uh, team colleagues looking for in an undergraduate application? The first section will cover your personal details, uh, your chosen courses. Um, it is very useful. You can look at the, at the UCAS portal and you can see all the other options, uh, all the options for the course that you're interested in starting, you can see all of the modules, description overall of the university, the courses, there are blogs that it can help, that it can help you decide which universities as it would be a better fit for you. On the second section, um, the admissions team will look into your qualifications, your grades obtained, and your predicted grades. And the third section, uh, you will need to submit an, a personal statement, which is like this mo motivational essay. I will talk about this later in the presentation. And on the sex, uh, section four, you will they will look into your um, references, which uh, should be submitted uh, by an, a tutor or uh, one of your uh, um, professors. So once you submit your applications and these are sent to the different universities, there are three different options uh, of three different um, optional, um, sorry, outcomes. Uh, so you could be either receiving an unconditional offer, which means that you've, re you've met all the requirements. You could also receive a conditional offer, which means that you are missing uh, one of the requirements or unsuccessful, that unfortunately you haven't met the requirements that we would need and that you haven't been accepted into the program. So you should wait until you receive all of your decisions from all of your choices. That means you should wait to hear all of the responses from all the universities that you applied to through UCAS. And then once you, you receive all the responses, you can apply to one. Uh, 
to. And if you meet all the conditions, then you will be uh, receiving a place in the program. Your firm choice, your insurance choice should be a university that you also want to go to, but maybe they're asking for lower entry requirements. So that should be your option B in, in case you, you have predicted grades and in the end you end up getting a bit lower of the grades that you thought you were going to receive, then you can, um, you can have your insurance uh, choice. And um, yeah, in case you, you don't meet the requirements for the firm choice. Any other offer that you receive that you are not either, either interested in setting as your firm choice or insurance choice should be declined. And it is not necessarily for you to, to have an insurance, but we also, we often recommend this to students. So the postgraduate application process is different. It's also a very selective admissions process. Um, most universities do to the website. So it means that you can create an account on, on each university's website and start submitting your applications. There are some, um, there's an option to submit your postgraduate application process through UCAS, although we don't, rec well, it's, it's, it's better, I think, if you apply directly to the university's um, website. So um, you apply directly with your documents. Um, the deadlines can vary. Usually applications for, let's say, September 2021 will start by the end of this September, early October. You can start your application for the following year. Um, I strongly recommend you visit uh, Manchester, Warwick, and Southampton's website because the deadlines may vary. Application uh, um, documents are usually the same, the entry requirements, but there might be differences between the uh, the deadlines that, that we that we have in different in, in these three universities. So I strongly recommend look into the the each requirements for each website uh, for each university. So. Um, usually, uh, Russell Group universities have one postgraduate intake per year. That means that, uh, except only we, we start our programs usually around September, um, late September, beginning of October. This year has been a bit unusual because of COVID. We, at least in Southampton, we, we have two intakes, one in September, October, and another one in January. Usually, we, as Russell Group universities, we only have one that's um, beginning sorry, late September, beginning of October. So most uh, programs do not automatically ask for an interview for medicine or for um, music. They might request an audition tape or an interview, but most uh, programs do not require an interview. So the, the deadlines uh, and the key dates might, again, might vary depending on the university. But usually applications start in September for the following academic year. Uh, around spring or early summer, we have the deadline for the applications. And by the end of the summer, you should submit all of the documents that you're missing um, in order to meet all of the conditions so you can have an unconditional offer. There are some scholarships that would require you to have an unconditional offer in order to apply for it. The university might have um, internal scholarships, but yes, um, you should be submitting all of your documents by the end of the summer and the course would be starting around late September, early October. And there are some universities that have a, an application fee from around 50 pounds. But again, this, vary depending, this varies depending on the university. So I strongly recommend you look into um, each university's website. So the postgraduate master's application process. Um, the admission selectors look for the first section, your personal details, um, general information, the chosen uh, course, and the second section that will look into your degree being relevant um, to the program that you want to study. Let's say if you studied veterinary, then you want to study a master's in music, then you know, it needs to be like a, uh, following the path in you know, your career. Um, so yeah, they will, they will look into having a degree that's relevant in the subject that you want to study, which modules you have taken, the grades that you've obtained, or in the case of not having your documents yet, the predicted grades. They would also look into your English language. We accept different uh, types of exams, but again, it depends on, on the university. 
the most um, mostly accepted in the very, uh, exams that most common exam sorry that we take uh, for English are uh, IELTS or TOEFL IPT. Uh, usually it's 6.5 or 7 on the IELTS in general, 92, 97 points in, in the TOEFL IBT. But again, this varies uh, from university to university. On the third section, they will look into your personal statement, which is this, this motivation essay about why you want to study this program, how is this going to help in your career, why are you a good fit. Um, but again, I will, I will briefly discuss about the personal statement later in the presentation. Um, in some cases, you might be asked to submit your resume, your CV, to see to check your working experience and see if this could help you um, to, to help our admission selector in, in the process. And on the section four, you need to submit to references from academic or employers or one of each. Oh, sorry. So once you submit your documents, again, the timelines change depending on the university. Uh, and then the university will email you our response once they've reviewed all your documents and made uh, considerations to your application. You have three possible outcomes. You can have a conditional offer, which means that you will be offered a place in the program, but you might still need to submit an English test or a, one of the reference letters or maybe a translation of your documents. So yeah, this type of things, um, it will show you on the conditional offer which documents you are still missing to submit. Um, to submit. And then unconditional means that you've uh, met all of the requirements and that you will be offered a place without any additional steps or, steps or instructions to be carried out after or unsuccessful, uh, which means that uh, you will not be considered for the program and that you have not been accepted. Some programs might require for you to to have um, to make a deposit in order to ensure and ensure your position or your place in the program. Uh, or they might have a deadline in order to, to apply. The application, again, as I mentioned before, is done through the uh, only portal of UCAS. You would need transcripts and certificates of um, previous degree, uh, your predicted degrees from school, a reference from your teacher or your tutor. You would need your personal statement, an English language, and in some cases, depending on the program, a portfolio. For a postgraduate program, you would also um, need your transcripts and certificates. Uh, if these are not uh, issued in English uh, and you took your course in Spanish or any other language, you would need to have them translated by a certified translator. Uh, you would need two references, uh, usually one academic, one professional, or two academics, a personal statement. Uh, English language, again, it depends on the program, uh, the requirements of the English language and the university. And then you also need, uh, again, in some programs, uh, your resume. And this is all done directly through the portal application from each university. So the personal statement, since in most most programs, uh, you will not be requested an interview. Your personal statement is your option to show yourself, to introduce yourself to the admissions team. So it's your opportunity to impress them and let them get to know you a bit more. It's both required by undergraduate and postgraduate um, applications. Um, this is your way of showing them that you are a good fit for the program, that you're very motivated. This is your option for you to show them what made you um, it could be, be, um, become interested in this area and this topic, why did you choose to study this, this area, demonstrate your abilities. If you've taken um, any extracurricular activities that have helped you into shaping to the person that you are today and that's going to help you um, in, your, in your program along, you know, the, the whole duration of the whole length of your 
of your program. You need to demonstrate your skills, that you understand your subject. How are you um, a good fit, a good profile for this program? And then this is going to, um, at the end, you should talk about how this is going to help you in your career. What are you hoping to achieve from this? Um, this is very important because this is your way of uh, showing yourself, introducing yourself to the admissions team. And um, yeah, this is also very uh, important in the consideration of your, of your application. It also needs to have a good structure, good academic English, you need to demonstrate that you're uh, capable of writing an academic document. Um, it is like an essay, but it should be written with very good English, academic English. It needs to have a structure, it needs to have um, a path. And, and this is very this is very important in your um, admissions process. Um, so something that I would like to mention is that it's not just uh, about your, your grades or the program that you want to study. So admissions team consider you as a whole person and not just about the numbers so your experience if you have again for undergraduate if you have maybe not working experience but under um, extracurricular activities or any clubs or members that um, sorry clubs or or uh, societies that you've been part of that have given you certain skills um, for postgraduate programs if you've done any volunteering activities if you have any working experience uh, if you have any disability, learning needs, they, these are all aspects that are considered in the application and it's not just about the numbers and the grades. So the entry requirements for undergraduate uh, in terms of grades might vary depending on, on the program. Um, if you are considering Russo Group University, the most likely will require to have three good um, A levels going from A plus to C. Uh, if you're studying an IB program, um, the points can vary depending, again, the program at university, but it can go from, it can range from 30 to 44, 42 points, um, including uh, good high level subject scores going from five to seven, uh, four to five in AP subjects or 650 to 750 in the um, ACIP subjects, um, a foundation year, at a recognized provider, let's say if you're if you did your foundation year back in your home country and you're going uh, directly to to direct entry, sorry for undergraduate program, um, you need to be um, an acceptable uh, foundation year provider. Uh, minimum score in your recognized uh, yeah, English language test, such as IELTS, if you took an IB, um, IGCSE. Um, so yeah, the, the entry requirements for the English test might vary depending on the program and university. Mm. And for postgraduate uh, masters, uh, if you're thinking about applying for a Russell Group University, most likely they'll ask you for your bachelor's degree and a minimum average grade um, from a second or first class. Um, if you're not sure what that will be equivalent to your country, I'm happy to look for this information and send it to you as well. Um, you need to demonstrate that you have good grades in the required modules or they are going to have an impact or are involved in the area that you want to study. Um, so that's it for me and then we'll go to different universities. Thank you so much Cecilia for this wonderful presentation and to Stephen and Caroline for the first part. We are back now to Stephen to hear more about Warwick. Um, these presentations will be about five minutes each, so in about 15 minutes we will be answering all your questions. And in the meantime, there are some prospectuses we have shared with you in the chat, so be sure to download them. Thank you again for watching. Thank you. So this is the University of Warwick. Uh, we are one of those 24 Russell Group universities, and you can see from the image on the right, uh, we're quite a green university. Uh, we're a campus university with just a single campus that contains all of our academic departments, student accommodation, and you can see that in purple, uh, a big art centre, one of the very largest outside of London, right in the middle of our campus, uh, a very large students' union, uh, and much else besides. We are between the very well-known cities of London and Birmingham. Uh, we're just 60 minutes away from central London uh, and 20 minutes away from Birmingham. 
So you have big cities on your doorstep that you can get to very easily. Uh, and because we're so central, uh, you can get to a real variety of what the UK has to offer. So you will, of course, all know London. Uh, you know, it might be synonymous in your minds with the UK, uh, but there is so much more to, to this country than just uh, our capital city. So the historic towns of Warwick, uh, Stratford-upon-Avon, uh, the pretty Georgian town of Leamington Spa, uh, modern cities like Coventry, uh, which is actually where our campus is based, and much else besides are close by. Uh, and you can see in that top circle that the uh, International Airport at Birmingham is just one stop on the train. Uh, it's very close by, it's just 10 minutes away from Coventry. So that's where we are. Uh, I've introduced already some of the research that our universities uh, will be doing uh, across the Russell Group, and this is what Warwick does. Uh, these are some of our key uh, interdisciplinary areas of research. Uh, and you'll have seen also that uh, the chair of the Russell Group is saying there how important it is that our universities contribute to world knowledge that can be transformative and change what's happening. Uh, you know, sustainability is a critical issue right now. Energy use, health, you know, in February, we might not have seen this one coming, but of course, these are vital, vital concerns um, that, that have been brought very close to home to many of us uh, this year. Sustainable cities, connecting cultures, uh, that brings in the arts and the social sciences as well. And this isn't everything we do, but these are some key strategic areas of research that we focus on that bring many of our subject areas together and make novel, new uh, and important connections and knowledge that can take things forward uh, and help with uh, future developments. These are some of the uh, departments that we have at Warwick, uh, many of the degree areas that we will teach. Uh, a large number of these will be top 10 in the UK. Uh, some of them have a practical focus, uh, but always with theory, as we've said, critical theory will be part of everything we teach. And there are increasingly degrees that we teach that link things together. So integrated science, uh, healthcare sciences, uh, also global sustainable development, liberal arts, that teach you to think not just about a subject, but about problem solving in the, the deepest and most wide sense. So for the 21st century, we need thinkers that aren't just steeped in a small piece of uh, a discipline, that don't just know a little bit about chemistry or astrophysics or uh, accountancy and finance. Important though those are, and those are things we teach, but we also want to develop thinkers who can answer complex, wicked questions, uh, these problems that are intractable and difficult to solve. And that's what these interdisciplinary degrees do. Politics, philosophy and economics, politics, philosophy and law, economics, philosophy and psychology. These sorts of disciplines uh, tend to do the same sort of thing. Uh, just in terms of our credentials, uh, these are some of the numbers that make Warwick the place that we are. Uh, we've been top 100 in the world uh, for a number of years now, uh, and there are around about 10,000 different universities, so we're right at the top echelon uh, of those. Uh, regularly and routinely um, close to and generally within the, the UK top 10. And I've also mentioned uh, about careers and employability. Uh, this is one of the things we really focus on at Warwick to make sure that our uh, students are getting into the very best jobs often well paid, uh, but in every case, uh, using to the fullest extent the knowledge you'd have learned. Uh, so we're 31st in the world for employer reputation uh, and third most targeted by the UK's top 100 graduate recruiters. The top three isn't what you might expect. So you'll see Manchester's uh, in the top three as well. Uh, Warwick has been in that top three for five consecutive years. Uh, so we are very focused on employability. Uh, just to add, the Times has come out this, this last week, uh, so a piece of news that we have nine subjects in the UK top five, uh, and we have 19 of our subjects in the UK top ten. Uh, so we are focused on excellence, we don't teach everything, we don't teach music or geography, uh, we don't actually teach undergraduate medicine, although we do teach uh, biomedicine. And what we do at Warwick is we focus on things we know we can be good at, uh, and we do them uh, as well as we can to make certain that we're teaching you at the very highest level uh, with the greatest degree of excellence. So I'm going to hand over now to Caroline, uh, who's going to introduce uh, Manchester to you. Hello, 
everyone. Um, so thanks for sticking with us. I will quickly talk to you a little bit about my university and then I'll pass back over to Cecilia. So the University of Manchester is uh, quite an old university, first established in 1824 and really known as kind of one of the first civic universities in the UK. Manchester as a city is kind of known as the second city in the UK after London and we have a really really rich heritage and history um, so you can see here on the screen some of the things that attract students to Manchester um, but I thought it might also be useful to share with you a little bit about where we are as well. So we're just two hours away from London by train and our international airport is just 30 minutes away from campus. There are over 100,000 students in Manchester across various different universities. So we at the University of Manchester are 40,000 students strong, just over. So one of the largest universities in the UK. But there's also um, a couple of other universities based in and around the city, which makes it one of the most um, popular cities to be a, a student in, in the UK. Um, what makes Manchester unique in terms of what the university offers is our vision. So we've defined three core goals and the first two are common to many UK universities. You'll see this talked about a lot, both world class research and an outstanding learning and teaching experience. Um, but the third core goal is unique to Manchester and its social responsibility. So many universities do have this as one of their key priorities but manchester is unique in stating it as one of their three core goals and that really translates both into the opportunities that we offer students inside of the classroom um, through our teaching and outside of the classroom through things like our ethical grand challenges which are social justice focused activities for students to participate in um, we also offer a really, really wide range of courses. So we've got over a thousand different degree programmes to offer across all three levels of study, uh, undergraduate, masters and PhD. And I've put on the screen here just a small selection of some of the areas that we teach in. So this is by no means exhaustive, but it kind of illustrates the breadth and the depth of what we offer at Manchester. Uh, we've got three big faculties, our Faculty of Humanities, which includes our business school, our Faculty of Science and Engineering and our Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health. So there's a broad, broad range of courses that we teach at Manchester. In terms of our rankings and our research power, you can see here that we are fairly highly ranked both within the UK and globally. 83% of our research was judged to be either world leading or internationally excellent in the most recent uh, research excellence framework. And as Stephen has already mentioned, this really translates down into our undergraduate teaching, both because these are your professors in your classroom that you are learning from, and because as undergraduates and masters and PhD students, you can have that opportunity to connect with that research and carry out some of that research yourselves. So finally, um, just to mention about graduate employability, Stephen mentioned this for Warwick and it's something that Manchester focuses on a lot as well. So 94% of our graduates are either in employment or further study within six months of graduating. There's something called the High Flyers Market Report, which measures how employers engage with UK universities. Manchester at the moment is first and has been consistently ranked first or at least in the top three in the last 10 years. And at the moment, we're fifth in the UK for graduate employability in terms of the QS rankings. So this kind of gives a flavour of who we are and what we do here at the University of Manchester. Um, and now I can hand over to Cecilia to talk to you about Southampton. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, we'll briefly talk about the University of Southampton. We are located in the south of England. We are we are in the top 20 in the UK. We're ranked 17th this year, according to the Complete University Guide. We're in the top 100 in the world. We're ranked 90th this year, according to the QS World Rankings. We have um, around 156 years of history. We have approximately around 26,000 students, from which around seven, seven, sorry, 6,500 uh, 6, international students come in from 135 countries. So we're very proud of our international community. We're a proud a member of the Russell Group and the Worldwide Universities Network. And as mentioned uh, before, and coming in the other Russell Group universities, we're very uh, a research intensity uh, um, known university. We're ranked eighth in the UK because of our research. 
Um, so we have different seven different campus, including one in Malaysia, five in Southampton, and one in Winchester. We cover lots of different areas, um, going from engineering. All of our engineering programs are in the top ten in the UK. We have um, health sciences, music, archaeology, um, marine biology, art and design. We have an art school in Winchester. Um, um, so yeah, we're, as I mentioned before, we're in the coast of England, we're in the south coast of England. Uh, we're uh, very proud to say that we are home of the National Oceanography Center, where we have lots of specialists in maritime law, marine biology, ship science. We're in the top UK university for sailing, which is a very cool activity for students and staff members, I have to say. Um, we're just around an hour and 20 minutes from London by train. Uh, we have lots of, um, again, research going on at the university. We do lots of research on um, uh, protons and, um, again, marine archaeology, marine biology, sustainability, energy. We have a cancer research that's uh, won awards. Um, our eye tracking uh, research is internationally recognized. Um, web science, so we cover lots of different areas. Um, I would like to say that we cover pretty much everything. We do not cover dentistry, um, veterinary, interior design, architecture, but we cover pretty much everything else. Um, so something that I really liked about Southampton is that it's close to lots of different cities. There's lots of activities going on around and our international community is very diverse. So very proud to say that. And I hope you consider Southampton as an option. Um, so uh, that's it for me. Thanks, Cecilia. Before we get to the questions, uh, I would just like to feel the atmosphere at those three universities. So uh, let's watch three short videos. This will give you time for last questions. And then I will ask again our presenters to join us and to make sure everyone has heard on their question, please. Last questions, we have about three minutes to to that part of the presentation. Thank you again. Warwick, home to the endlessly curious, the people who move things forward, the pioneers who look to the future. That's who we've always been. And today, in these uncertain times, that's still who we are. This may be new territory we're all treading, but that's what we've always done. Life isn't how we knew it, but we're ready. Yet we can't do this alone. We need you here, and together, we can embrace whatever life has in store. Warwick, on campus together. University is a place that evokes many words. It's a vibrant and exciting community. For me, it's a sense of pride. It's a place where you can wander through knowledge. It's a home. This is where I've grown up. Every year, thousands of students graduate from the University of Manchester, and they go on to make a major contribution to the wider world. I think the defining characteristics of our students here in Manchester are um, academic excellence. Manchester is superb at providing both the, the specific education that you want but also it gives you that rounded experience of growing up in one of the world's major cities. Manchester is definitely the best university. It's fantastic at research but it provides a great student experience. It's in a brilliant city and it makes a real difference to our communities. We all come from different places, new faces. You want to try something new on for size? No disguise, bright-eyed wise. 
You're learning, it's burning, the passion inspired. There's grafting, it's lasting, but it's yours for commanding. You're built from the ground up. The soles of your feet meet the place where your passion pounds the sound of the streets. The soul of your mind, deep inside the impossible kind. You've got the right to go from naught to 60 in no time at all. This is your time to shine. This is your time to fall down. You're falling, free, flying. Your hands make the plan. They mold and they shape to create the cityscape. Not just the sky rise scene, but the people within and where they have been. Mind racing, game changing, hair raising, climb. No time filling, stand stilling, waste nothing time. The wind in your face and the salt in your eyes. The grind, you strive, the lion inside. Fire and flames have changed what they mean. You were born somewhere else, but you'll be made in this city. Say yes to what comes, don't just wave as they pass. This world is for those that grasp every chance. Dream of improbable things and the journey you'll take. Those that think outside the box tend to bring about the change. Fortune tends to favour the brave. So find the courage to build the paths that you'll pave. Because a ripple in the water might just become a wave. This place is for dreamers, believers and schemers. Team players and game changers. The nightlife, the daylight, the bright lights and sunshine. The wet days and walkways, the green place and deep space. The people around us, the me and the you, build us up, break us down, rebuild and renew. We're here when you need us, to guide and provide. But this journey is yours, to capture and ride. You'll be made. That was a wonderful, wonderful video. And with this, I would like to welcome everyone back to the stage so that we can proceed to the questions from our audience. We will try to group them. So um, if you still have not heard your question, it was probably answered by one of our uh, presenters today, or we will get back to it later. So. I will start with a question from Pavel. I have actually seen it responded in the chat, but maybe it will be repeated later on. So let's get to that question first. It goes like this. Will EU nationals still be eligible for free study after trans transition period ends? Um, Pavel is applying in 2021, and there was the same question for 2023. Um, here, maybe we should um, stress that there is no free, but we're talking about uh, getting funds for, for education. Um, Stephen, would you like to take this question first, please? Yes, of course. Uh, so we're looking this year at a change because of Brexit. Uh, so for EU nationals, uh, fees will be increasing uh, to be the same as for international students generally. But that's only half of the picture. So alongside that, many of our universities are now looking at scholarships. Um, it has to be said, not just necessarily EU students, but potentially for other nationalities as well. So we're revisiting our scholarship offerings. Um, and what's happening is that there's a lack now of standardisation. So universities are doing different things locally. Uh, and my adv advice would therefore to be to look firstly at the fee. The fee will uh, change. It will go up this year. Uh, for UK um, universities for EU students but to balance that against what's going to be announced for scholarship support but you'll need to do that because it's non-standard across all of our different universities so the advice would be to find out where you want to go uh, make a short list and then look at our funding pages I, I don't think there is a better answer than that thank you Stephen um, Caroline Cecilia is there anything you would like to add or is your answer similar to Stevens? I think that was a, a perfect summary and I think it does represent us as you know a sector as a whole. Great. Um, the next question is still a really great topic. Great, thanks Cecilia. So the next question comes from Lucy. I would ask Cecilia to answer this one. So Lucy is a UK citizen and has lived there most of her life, but currently Lucy is living in Germany for the past two years and she will be applying in autumn 2022. So the question is, will I have to make a case for having home fees as information about this topic seems, seems vague at the moment? Cecilia, what shall we say to Lucy? From my, uh, from my understanding, I, I believe this, the, even if, if you're a UK um, passport holder, 
we need to have lived the past three years and paid taxes in the UK in order to have home fees. Um, it might be that it changes um, in the future, uh, but this, I think, it would meet, it would need to be revised by the time of, um, she's, she's intending to apply. I don't know if this would be different for Warwick or Manchester, or if there's anything you would like to add to this. For Stephen and yeah, I don't have anything particularly to add. I don't know if Caroline, you've got anything. advise on because so much can depend on your individual circumstances so I think the best advice really is to consult the gov.uk website because that clearly sets out the position to, you know depending on what circumstance that you're in um, so I think where you have obviously um, spent some time most of your time in, in the UK before and then only recently moved is obviously completely different to perhaps having a UK passport but never having lived in the UK so for different individuals, the situation will be different. So I think my main piece of advice would be to check the gov.uk website. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that. And again, uh, please check regularly the websites of these universities. I'm sure that whenever there is anything changing, uh, it will be on each one of them. So I would like to move now to the application process itself. Uh, we have quite a big audience here today from IB schools. So I will take the IB questions first. Um, Stephen, is there a minimum of points needed from the IB in general at your institution? I believe it will vary by program, but if you would have to set a minimum minimum for the IB, and then I would like to ask the same question to Caroline and Cecilia. Yeah, so I would say for the majority of our programs, the standard is of 38 for IB. Uh, that would be not necessarily an absolute minimum. Uh, but for many of our biggest programs, including business, engineering, uh, some of the sciences, English, history, these sorts of subjects, it will tend to be a 38. Um, it does vary for some other courses. So if you're looking at biosciences, and that could be biomedicine, biological sciences, neuroscience, these sorts of topics, you may see courses where there's a, a variation. You could be looking at a 36 with one hard science or a 34. I'm sorry, 36 if you've got two hard sciences and the 34 if you've just got the one, if you've just got biology. You'll see some like mathematics, uh, which are more, so more along the sort of 39, 40 area, uh, but depending on whether you have additional uh, step papers, TMUA, TMA, uh, these sorts of additional um, papers that you can take. Um, normally, and certainly for Warwick, and um, I'll let my colleagues uh, at Southampton and Manchester answer this for themselves, you will find IB requirements published. So we often put them on our websites. Um, and many of us as well will have a number of different other qualifications that we also publish uh, on international pages. They're not always easy to find. So if you cannot find what you're looking for, you know, always talk to us, of course, um, and we can point you in the right direction for where those uh, uh, criteria sit. Do you have anything to add? Maybe you have different minimum for mention. Yeah, uh, it's similar in the sense that we have different requirements according to the different subjects that you might be interested in studying. Our minimum points tend to be uh, 32 or so, and then it ranges um, sort of 39 plus, depending on the, the subject that you're interested in. The course finder that we have on our website always includes the IB points as well as the A-level points. So um, it's quite easy to find that information on our website. But um, the sort of more humanities and social sciences subjects tend to be towards the lower end of the scale. And then some of our science subjects um, and biology subjects tend to be a little bit higher. So I think my advice there would be to check the, the website of the course that you're interested in. So I will direct question to her if you want to add up this one of course Cecilia yeah it's pretty much the same case for Southampton our minimum um, um, IB points I think for arts and humanities are 32 points which is which are on the lower um, yeah requirements but for some programs of engineering uh, the minimum would be around 38 points so yeah the, the IB requirements are also included on our perspectives and it's really they're really easy to find if you go into the the website for Southampton. So yeah, same case. 
fair enough. And for everyone watching us still, for which we're very grateful because we know it's a Saturday, but as you can see, there's so much useful information. I will be sharing with you the recording of today's webinar, as well as the prospectuses of the universities and the contact details of Caroline, Stephen and Cecilia. So if you have asked us a very specific question on a program, you will probably find it on the prospectus, but it's definitely a good idea to talk to the um, to the three admissions officers directly. So we will be going to questions that are going to help more people that are more broad. So there is another question related to IB studies and it's Juan is asking, I'm taking the IB diploma program. Do I have to wait until I receive my final grades in August to decide which of the five universities I want to go to? Caroline, can you take that one, please? In terms of making the initial application, you don't need to wait until you have your final awarded grades. And actually, we would recommend that you apply quite a lot earlier in the process, particularly because applications are so competitive. And if you wait until later in the year, you may find that the course that you're interested in is full. So what you normally are doing is applying with your predicted grades. Um, if you have any subject specific requirements for your program, then we'll ask what you're um, likely to achieve in your higher level subjects and we'll ask for a minimum number of points overall. Your teacher at school can help you with your predicted grades when you're making your UCAS application. Um, you'll then receive um, a conditional offer, which is waiting for your final exam results. And then once you get your final exam results, you'll be choosing um, you know, which university you finally want to go to. Question again from Juan, and I believe that's uh, regard, uh, related to this unlikely scenario that we have experienced last summer. What happens if your final grades are a little bit below your predicted grades? Um, do students still have a chance to be admitted? Like, how, how did you deal with that this year, for example? Um, yeah, this or year was, uh, <laughs> to deal with than most years. Um, but it does happen every year that, you know, students maybe miss out on their overall number of points or one of their higher level subjects very narrowly. Where we can offer flexibility, we will. Um, but sometimes the courses are so competitive that, you know, if, if it's a quite a big miss between what you were predicted to get and what you've actually achieved, then we may, for example, um, offer you a different place on another course that's more flexible, um, or you can go into the confirmation and clearing process. So we are as flexible as we possibly can be, um, and we just have to kind of take those cases as and, as and when they come up. Um, there was a question if if you're doing the IB uh, diploma program in English, would that be enough of an English language proof? Um, Cecilia? Yes, would following the IB diploma program in English be, um, will that be accepted as an English language proof? Proof of English. I don't think your audio is on, uh, Cecilia. I can read your lips, but not so well. <laughs> no worries. And, so, I, and I still have them to me, sorry. Um, so I think for Southampton, for Southampton uh, in most cases, the IB, would, um, the IB diploma is enough to, um, as a proof of English uh, certificate. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if it's the same in the other universities. For most cases, that, that should be enough for us. Um, I don't know if it's the same for Manchester and Warwick. Yes, it will take a uh, high level four or five, so that will be enough um, for our programmes. What you'll see for, for certainly Warwick and I imagine other universities is banding according the type, to the type of course you're taking. Uh, so if you're in a science based subject, quite often the English language requirement is a little bit lower purely because the demands of the course are more focused on scientific universal language. You know, mathematics rather than English, um, whereas creative writing or one of these more uh, literate courses and literary courses uh, will require a higher level of, of English. It's exactly the same for Manchester as well, scores of four or five and bandings as well. Okay. Well, moving on from IB to other curriculums, and I think here it's, um, it's the moment to ask a question that we just received in the chat from Linda. 
it's not only IB, SAT, A levels that you guys consider for the application, right? So, um, what do you tell to students from? We have a big audience today from Central America, um, graduating uh, with their own national curriculum. Um, what would be the best way for them to apply? How important is their high school diploma, which is none of the international ones we have been talking about? Who wants to take this one first? <laughs> maybe Cecilia, because she is geographically the nearest <laughs> currently. Um, Cecilia, what, what does a student from Guatemala with a Guatemalan high school diploma need to do additionally to apply to Southampton? Cecilia, so Caroline, do you mind taking that question? on which country you're coming from. So we have on our website a number of Latin American uh, country pages. Unfortunately, Ecuador is not one of them, but we do have a country manager for all of the Latin American countries. So we can you know, take that question offline if, if necessary. But effectively, um, national curricula fall into one of two scenarios. So either it can be accepted as a direct equivalent to A-level, in which case you can use that to apply through UCAS, or in some cases, universities will have assessed the national curriculum as not equivalent to A-level and therefore we'd normally recommend some kind of foundation year either with the university itself, if it offers a foundation year in that subject or area, or with a foundation year partner. Stephen, I think you want to add something? So I've just, um, while we've been talking, I've been looking at our country pages um, and for Guatemala and for Ecuador and also for Mexico, um, we require the International Foundation Programme for undergraduate degrees. Uh, we do have a pathway for direct entry onto master's degrees, so MSc uh, and MA. Uh, what I'll do, and I, I don't know if my colleagues at other universities want to do the same, is I'm just going to copy and paste our international requirements into the chat. Um, just That's so you great. can observe. Um, and this is a list of all of our different countries. Uh, there are one or two countries where we haven't published our guidance. Um, and in, in those cases, if you inquire with us directly with the contact details you're given, um, I'm sure all of us will be very happy to, to take those inquiries. That would be wonderful. And with this, I'm going to the next question. Um, it is from Kevin. At my school, we give anticipated IB grades in the fall semester. We do our mock exams in February and they give a better idea of how students will perform. What if a student gets a third anticipated and does not get a conditional offer, but after mock exams, we see a huge improvement and predict higher IB scores? Is it possible for the student to apply again? For us, fall is still very hard to anticipate with good accuracy sometimes. I will post this question in uh, our admin chat for you to go back to it. It's a long one, but it's a very valid mm -hmm. one. I believe uh, this is Kevin from Peterson School in Mexico, which is an IB school. And uh, I believe that question will be asked by a number of counselors watching us today. Um, who wants to start? Maybe Caroline? question again. Sure. Okay? So it is in our chat. If you want to go back to it, it goes like this. At my school, we give anticipated nice. IB grades in the fall semester. We do our mock exams in February and they give a better idea of how students will perform. What if a student gets a 30 anticipated and does not get a conditional offer? But after mock exams, we see a huge improvement and predict higher IB scores. Is it possible for the student to apply again? For us, Kevin says, fall is still very hard to anticipate with good accuracy. Yeah, I, I understand. I mean, I guess the advantage of the IB curriculum is it is very robust. Um, so it's a, a good curriculum to be presenting with in the first instance. Um, how it works for you, Cass, is that you can only apply once as part of the main process. So if you don't receive an offer at the university that you are interested in initially, a conditional offer, 
pending your final exam results if you do end up doing quite a lot better you can then go through a process later on in the summer where you can sort of re reapply effectively to some of the universities that you're interested in, in and say, hey, you know, I, I did actually quite a lot better than I thought I was going to. Could you reconsider my application? Do you still have spaces? Um, so that's certainly, I think, how it would work for, for Manchester. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to, to add in. Where, you know, you initially have five choices you normally have one that's above what you expect and you do your best and hope that they accept you first off, um, some in the middle and then maybe a backup choice. But then you have UCAS Extra later in the year, which enables you to come back in and have another go. Um, Caroline's already mentioned confirmation and clearing. Uh, so clearing if you, you miss your grades, uh, but also then you've got adjustments and you've got other ways of getting in if you do better than expected. So there are different points of entry um, you then have a decision. There is a bit of a, a decision over the summer where you think, well, do I want to release myself if you have an offer, but it's not your firm choice? Do you want to release yourself to then be considered by other universities? Um, but it's quite a common process. And UCAS has been designed in this way because we understand that you'll be, some of you will outperform your expectations. Some of you will just under hit a little bit. And in each case, we want to give you some options. Okay, so we are still in that same topic. We're applying, we're, we have a, our predicted grades, we're waiting for the good news to come. Uh, in these regards, Vanshika from uh, Spain, I believe, is asking, um, do you have to wait until the end of August, which is when we get our A-levels to, uh, to get your final answers from all five universities, or sorry, to give your final answers to all five universities? That's to say, decide which one you want to go after receiving your grades. I've seen you answering that question before, but it's uh, in a similar way. It has been asked a few times. So with this, I would like to conclude the timing of the application. Um, Caroline? As part of the UCAS application process, you will be asked to um, indicate one university, which is the one that you really, really want to go to from your conditional offers and that will become your firm choice your preferred choice and then you'll also be able to choose an insurance choice so you'll be able to say that if I don't get those grades actually I would be happy to go to this other university and um, so then what happens is you kind of go into basically a holding pattern while you wait for your exam results and then if you meet the conditions of your firm choice that's the university that you're going to unless you change your mind if you don't meet the offer conditions of your firm choice but you do meet your insurance offer then you go there and if you still don't meet the uh, conditions of any of your offers then you can kind of go back into that summer process that I was referring to before of, of trying to find another university so initially you'll choose sort of a, a top top choice and a backup choice and then you'll wait for your plan results on exams and qualification first do you all accept Duolingo no recognizing obviously the difficulty that the global pandemic has caused so for example we can accept um, the TOEFL at home IBT special edition exam so that's another online exam and we can also accept an exam called language cert um, we are looking as we go on at other qualifications that we can accept but for us at Manchester the key uh, requirement if you like is is an exam that is proctored or invigilated digitally so something that is verifiable which is why we don't accept uh duolingo for example unfortunately is yeah yeah Stephen, sorry uh so we do um we had our um center of applied linguistics look into this and we did consider it carefully and uh, as caroline said some universities will some won't because they're, they're reading these tests in different ways um, what I don't know is what's going to happen this next year because it was a contingent measure based on the fact that many students couldn't take physical tests because these test centres were closed. Uh, so if test centres stay closed, I would imagine we will continue to accept Duolingo. If they reopen, I don't know whether IELTS, TOEFL, Cambridge Advanced and these similar options will be the ones that we'll be looking at. Uh, again, what I'll do, and I'll, Cecilia will uh, have answers for Southampton, I imagine, uh, is just copy and paste uh, English language into the chat so you can follow that up. 
yeah for us uh, at southampton we we are we were accepting it for for this academic year uh 2022 2021 but um it hasn't been confirmed for the following year again i, I assume same as Stephen, if if the situation continues um like this and, and the t test centers are still closed i imagine we will still be accepting this for the following year but it this hasn't been confirmed at least for southampton yet great i believe yeah go ahead caroline sorry as well so um you know we are accepting it at the moment but we we may have to review it obviously if, if test centers reopen i think the the default position is probably going to be a preference for one of the more traditional tests there was a question uh, from Kevin, and I believe he would have to check the same links you just mentioned, uh, just to make sure I'm not mistaken. Um, Kevin is asking, I know that in many cases, the IELTS is needed for admission and the visa as well. Will all can With all cancellations of testing centers, can a student use the online version? Question on IELTS. Would that be an information Kevin can find on those links you are about to share? Wonderful. Great. So, Kevin, you can see in the chat, our presenters will now share more information. And then there was a question uh, from Lily, which I would like to read. Uh, Lily is in ninth grade, and she's asking, apart from focusing on her grades and extracurricular activities, what else can she do to, when it comes time to apply to a Russell Group University, have a better application and Lily congratulations for planning so well ahead that's that's wonderful and for being with us on a Saturday um, two or three years before your graduation so what should Lily do from now that's if, yep. if you like. go ahead yeah it's, it's a really good question um, what I would refer back to is the one of those early slides that I introduced on the difference between Russell Group and Ivy League um, and there is a difference between a statement of purpose and what the US system will tend to look for and what Russell Group universities tend to look for, which tends to be very linked to your course. Now, there's no one right way of doing it, so don't worry too much about, you know, getting it right, because in some ways what you're trying to do is to stand out and to have a personal statement that is unique as it possibly can be to your own interests, but that at every step, speaks loudly to your uh, aptitude and suitability for the course you're applying to. So if you are keen on film and television or you're keen on anthropology, everything you're putting into that, like a set of ingredients, mixes together and is it comes to a consistent uh, and consistent, um, advocacy really of your suitability for that course. Um, there are lots and lots of guides, and I think you may have seen in this session, there's a personal statement guide. Many universities will have one of these. You know, you could be looking, if you're interested in politics or things like Model United Nations, there are things that people will often include, uh, but there is no right set of ingredients, um, which probably doesn't help in some ways, uh, but hopefully frees you up in others to just explore your interests, um, you know, and think, and think more openly about what you put into your personal statement. Um, I don't know if Caroline or Cecilia, you wanted to add to that? Or? Yeah, I, I would agree with everything that you've just said. And I think, um, you know, mentioning that there's no right set of ingredients can sometimes seem daunting as a student when you're preparing your UCAS application, but you should really view it as a positive. So, for example, depending on, you know, where you live and, and what your circumstances are, you might not have the opportunity to gain any practical experience of your course um, and be able to talk about that. But what we're really looking for is a keen interest in the subject and also a clear understanding from you of the kinds of courses that you have applied for. So that's something that is going to really help you in your personal statement, that kind of level of clarity, making sure that you're structuring it in the right way. So talking about the things that you have done in the past, what you learn from those experiences and how it's relevant to the courses that you're applying for that will make a really standout personal statement and cecilia so they've covered <clears throat> sorry everything I, I agree completely with what they've, what they've said 
Great, thank you, Lily. Good luck. And I, I wish I could have my camera on, but I do prefer to have those wonderful images on the screen. Mm -hmm. So it will be still my voice uh, reading the next question. And it comes from Kevin and uh, Renee. With regards to the references, do you accept bullet point letters like they are doing in the US or is it better to follow a certain style? Now, Cecilia covered the application process. Why don't you take this one? Um, I, yeah, I guess in, in my experience, I haven't seen kind of those um, person statements with like bullet points. Um, I imagine that that might be um, more of a standard in the US. Yeah, sorry, that's a question coming from uh, school counselors. Oh, about reference yes. letters. Sorry. Right. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if, it, if it, um, either Stephen or Caroline would like to answer that question because I mostly get applicants for postgrad. Um, so, sorry. Um, that we get at Warwick, but I would say, you know, as, as Caroline said, with a personal statement, structure is quite important. Um, we would never, with a personal statement, want to see bullet points. And I would say reference is probably the same, although slightly, slightly less, you know, it's not quite as, as key as the personal statement, um, really to write it in a sort of more standard, uh, more prose based way would be certainly advisable, I would say, for the UK. Of what we talked about in the personal statement from the student we're looking for evidence based the bullet points um format might not give the best illustration of that so um you know where you're trying to illustrate that you think this is a really fantastic student who would be a great addition to the university kind of talking about why you've reached that conclusion in in a sort of expanded format i think is probably certainly more common Rene and Kevin uh, with that question and um, having a little pause from the admissions we will go back to it but there is one question which still uh, makes our audience um, uh, wait for an answer and that how did you guys start this uh, this academic year did you start presentially did you start online um, these were partially uh, covered by your presentation but what is the current um, COVID response at your universities if you can all um, share your um, answers uh, starting with Stephen and then Caroline and Cecilia it's an understandable question this year uh, the video I shared was a little bit more COVID linked actually than I would normally share uh, partly because I know this is a, a common question um, this year we've got a mix so at the moment we've got a hybrid model which I think is widely standard across the UK Certainly back in June, the Universities UK did a poll and they found that 97% of universities were looking at a blended approach, uh, which is what we're going with. Uh, this means that for small group teaching of up to 25 students, we are in our 720 acre campus, you know, sp spacing people out as much as we can, um, making certain that there is safety, of course, at the heart of what we do, but that we're not missing out on that key face to face dynamic interaction that you get. You know, it's the, the difference between you listening to this in your own time at home and getting direct answers to your questions now live in the session. You know, we want to have that face to face uh, wherever we can for our seminar teaching in particular. Um, I expect that we are going to keep revisiting this because public health can't necessarily be contained. So the answer I give today may not be the answer I give you tomorrow or in three months time. Um, but certainly all the work we've been putting in and the the ambition of our teaching staff has been to maintain safe face-to-face -face teaching wherever we can. Uh, students are visiting, you know, are coming to our campus, they're settling in at the moment, uh, and we're endeavouring to make life as normal um, as well as as safe as possible for all our students. Uh, Caroline, I don't know what's, what Manchester, how that compares with what, what Manchester's doing. So um, we're the same, all of our kind of large group teaching, so a lecture where you would typically see, you know, 200 people on a Monday morning, it just isn't possible at the moment to deliver that in a safe way. So although we have, similar to Warwick, a really large physical estate, we can't accommodate that those kinds of um, 
teaching settings at the moment so we've moved all of that online um, and it will be in place like that certainly for first semester and as Stephen also mentioned reviewed on an ongoing basis um, and then our smaller group teaching those sort of seminars and laboratories they will all be delivered face to face as much as is practically possible and I think the desire both on the student side of things and on the staff side of things is to get back to normal as quickly as possible but to make sure that that is done safely so we'll keep it under regular review and I think Stephen's point of you know being able to give one answer today and the situation changing one way or the other uh, you know a little bit down the line is is a very valid one. receiving students for the past couple of weeks. Um, some of our lecture rooms have been kind of adapted um, to have seats, um, to skip seats. So not everybody's uh, like right next to each other. Um, we are offering the option of having most of our modules online, uh, but there are some cuts that have been split into two. So, um, so it's not, um, like a regular auditorium where you would usually have the classes. Um, so some of our modules are being delivered face to face and some of our modules are being delivered like fully online. Uh, but this will, again, the safety of our staff members and our students are still, is still the main priority for us. So this will be going on a revision every, every single month to see if, if things progress. And there, if there are other steps that or other measurements that need to be taking to assure everybody's safety. Um, but yeah, it's, I think, very similar to the other universities as well. But unfortunately, we cannot uh, see how that will develop for students starting in 2021. So again, let's all be safe, mindful, and uh, get as much information as we can. And I'm sure that you have done your best to provide the safest facilities. That's, that's very important, especially now that a lot of students have taken a gap year, um, uncertain of, uh, of how they can, they can start studying. But now we have seen that there are actually a lot of um, developments that, uh, that you have undertaken last summer. Now, speaking about gap year, um, there was a question from the chat. If a student considers taking a gap year, should they apply through UCAS this year for admission of 2022 or next year? Caroline, uh, what do you say? For deferred entry, so apply in the sort of current academic year knowing that they will um, want to start their studies the following year, or they can wait um, until closer to the time of starting their studies. Where you are coming and talking about your gap year in your application, certainly at Manchester, we would like to see you talking about that productively. So telling us about how you've used that time, um, you know, skills that you have developed, experiences that you've had that have made you a more rounded individual, um, so, you know, kind of framing that in a really positive way. Yes, on uh, gap years, um, very much the same uh, for Warwick. Um, you know, it's, it's often a, a bonus to have a gap year if you've taken one because it gives you life experience. You may have traveled, you may have worked with charities and NGOs, uh, whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's often something you can work into your personal statement. Um, in terms of when to apply, Absolutely, you can apply this year if you want, and you can consider deferred entry. Uh, there'd be no harm in doing that, or you could apply for next year. Um, you know, I'm, I, either is fine, um, but it just depends. You know, if after your gap year, it's going to have transformed your thinking, it's going to have transformed your direction of travel. Uh, in terms of the subject you take as well, you may think, well, actually, maybe I'll wait until I know what I want to do. Whereas if you absolutely have your heart set on a subject and that's not going to change, you maybe want to apply for that uh, a bit sooner. Okay, that answers the questions, I hope. And still um, around the when is the best to topic, uh, we're kind of merging from a topic to topic, but we have such an active audience. I'm really grateful and, and glad to take their questions for as long as you guys are still here. So Florencia asked just now, 
if I have my final grades in December, is it better to apply before December to make sure that the course isn't full or after I have my grades? And I believe Florencia would be an example of a student graduating in what in Europe is autumn. Um, so that question would be repeated. Uh, Caroline. If you wanted to Celia to answer that one with a more kind of uh... sure Cecilia uh, I'm not sure if you heard the questions because you just joined again if I have my final grades in December is it better to apply before December to make sure the course isn't still full or after I have all my grades um, what we usually <clears throat> sorry recommend is to apply yeah by December just to ensure the the place and then if uh, she gets the, the remainder of the results afterwards um, she can still just submit it um, later so I think our recommendation is usually for all of our students to apply by December I don't know if it's that different in in the other universities and think would be who would typically graduate in November, December, and they will yeah. be applying for the upcoming September intake. Okay, yes. I mean, we would say um, often that there is an advantage to some extent in applying a little bit sooner. Um, we do make a small number of offers in the autumn for very strong candidates. Uh, so if you're in that position, you know, you can secure some certainty by applying earlier. Um, it doesn't happen to many students, I would say, so it's not necessarily going to um, make much difference. Um, and then from January onwards, we gather, we often gather a field of applicants together. And after the 15th of January deadline, we start to consider students together. Um, so there may be a small advantage. I wouldn't say it's necessary uh, for us to apply at that point. What I wouldn't do for any university in the UK is apply getting to close to midnight on the 14th of January, <laughs> you know, give yourself time to make sure all your documents are together because that's quite a hard deadline uh, for many of our universities. Uh, unanimous answer. And while I was talking to Cecilia, I wanted to ask a question from Beatriz, who's in Mexico. Um, hi, Bea from Mexico, interested to make a master degree or a conversional uh, master, I am an MD degree in Mexico City. Is there a difference in requirements or fees if coming from Mexico or from a country in EU? Thanks. I will direct this question to Cecilia. Um, okay, so up until this December, the EU and um, UK fees were the same. So I think starting for next year, it will be the same uh, fees for uh, Mexican students than from the rest of the world as all international students, uh, overseas students. Um, the requirements are still kind of the same. We would, we would accept the equivalent of your uh, master's degree diploma in Mexico uh, and your grades um, in order to process the application um, process. But in terms of requirements, it's still the same requirements, university diploma, transcripts, uh, second or first class, um, um, as minimum average grades, of, of, I believe it's a second class. Um, um, what else? Recommendation letters, um, personal statements. So in terms of different requirements, I would say no, it's the same requirements. The fees um, are still going to be the same overseas international students. Um, so I don't know if that, if that answers the question. She just confirmed. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, next question would be from Alejandro. Um, I would ask this question to Caroline. Is it possible to apply for scholarship if I'm undertaking the NCUK program? Will it be taken into consideration the same way as any other qualification or will I be considered for the NCUK scholarship? Yeah, we may be able to consider that um, application in terms of, of scholarship. So I think it depends um, on the exact circumstances. So that one, I think I probably prefer to 
to answer offline because it maybe affects fewer students. But yeah, happy to have that conversation. Wonderful. Again, we will share uh, the contact details with all our presenters over email. You will all receive an email with the recording and the prospectuses in case you had to leave earlier, um, which means you're not even listening to this now. <laughs> but there will be a recording and contact details will be shared. Uh, now, there was a few questions related to medicine, and I would like to wrap the medicine topics. So from all over the world, students want to study medicine, which is, at least for me, the most wonderful job in the planet. Um, Stephen, what do you tell international students who are thinking to do that undergrad, well, entire studies in the UK without coming out of the UK high school system? I may be slightly less well qualified uh, than my colleagues here because we don't actually teach undergraduate medicine. Um, what we do teach is biomedicine. So we teach a course that's often the fifth choice on your UCAS application. Uh, with UCAS, you only get four choices that you can use on medicine. Uh, and there is a fifth choice that we would then be able to offer you. Uh, we have the UK's largest MBCHB programme, which is graduate entry medicine. Uh, it does take a very small number. And this is a slightly separate question than the undergraduate medical degree. Uh, and, but I imagine the answer may be similar in that we only take a very small number of international students onto the MBCHB. Um, you can apply, um, but it's worth joining in, particularly for um, those of you looking at the MBCHB, some of the virtual open days that are happening specifically with these departments, because they often have quite in-depth admissions guidance, um, and our medical school is providing that particular guidance through uh, virtual open days. Um, and obviously Manchester's very big on science and so is Southampton. So I don't know if I want to maybe just uh, ask you guys, what, what do you do for, um, for medicine? Yeah, so the guidance for us would actually be similar to what Stephen mentioned for their postgrad options. So um, it's, it's very, very competitive for international students who want to study medicine in the UK. The number of places tends to be capped by the UK government and the numbers tend to be quite small. Um, so in terms of the application process, I would really strongly encourage students to read our website. We're very, very transparent in our entry requirements. Medicine is actually one of my favourite things to talk about, um, similar to Lena, because I just have such admiration for the students who want to uh, go down that career path. But um, I always really encourage students to read the application information um, because it is, you know, it explains clearly step by step what is required. Um, so, you know, we offer a holistic applications process at Manchester, which means that we look at both your predicted grades, your clinical aptitude test score and things like your, you know, your written submission. Um, but if you kind of go into that process as well informed as you can be, then that will give you the best chance of success in a really, really competitive environment. Yeah, I agree with Caroline. Uh, for us in Southampton, we have only 12 positions for international students at an undergraduate level in medicine. So um, unless they have taken either an IB course with the specific high uh, levels and gotten the grades that we required, it's it's a very it's very difficult and very competitive to to get into. I'm not saying it's not possible. I have had. Um, uh, Latin American students coming or other international students coming to study medicine at an undergraduate level but um, yeah I would also encourage everybody to look into our website and check out the requirements um, and specific high levels that you would need in order to be considered for the program um, for what is a, a very competitive uh, program but um, yeah and I don't want to say it's impossible um, just trying to manage everybody's expectations as well Want to study medicine regardless where you do that it will be some wonderful years ahead and we wish you good luck uh, it's definitely also the hardest one of the hardest programs to to get to and to complete but um yeah with admiration. so we're going towards the end of today's webinar i will read two more questions and um Again, to Cecilia, I would like to ask, because that was part of her presentation, if you could repeat again the difference between conditional and unconditional uh, offer. 
am I right? I think that was part. Sorry, you got cut off. Is it just about the difference? Yes, just that to, to specify what's the main difference between conditional yeah, and so conditional. Thank you. Okay, so let's say that maybe you've got almost all of your documents ready. You've got your personal statement, um, your reference letters, and uh, your, your diploma, and you submit everything, but you're missing the English test one of the reference letters. If you're missing one of the documents and still submit um, your application, it will be considered and it will be processed and the university will give you a conditional offer. So this will, if, if this is not a postgraduate level, the university will consider this place, it will save your spot in the program, but it will still ask you to provide the, the missing documents. Or if you need to amend any of the documents that you have already submitted, the university will give you a conditional offer. That means that either one of your documents needs to be revised or you need to submit a new document or you haven't submitted one of the requirements, um, one of the documents that are that is being required. In the case that you've already submitted all the documents that um, the, the application process required, then you will be issued an unconditional offer, which means that you no longer need to do anything else because everything has, like all the conditions have been met. It might be that you get a conditional offer based on a deposit because a program, in order to secure the spot, requires for you to pay a, um, like a thousand pound deposit or um, it can be either a condition based on a deposit or a condition based on an academic uh, document or an academic yeah condition. So. Those are basically the, the differences uh, between unconditional and conditional. I don't know if this um, answers the question. A question, if there is still something not clear, uh, we advise to talk to you and to go over your prospectuses. And the very, very last question, and there will be so many more. And again, we're so grateful for you to, to being so proactive today as an audience. Um, it is related to um, sports activities in high school and how would they convert at the time of application. So basically, do you guys offer sports scholarships? Can a student with a sport talent be engaged in any of your um, clubs or do you have teams? So for those students who are usually um, more, uh, more proactive with, the, uh, with, with their sports activities, how can they succeed at uh, your institutions? Stephen, would you like to go first? Absolutely. So, yes, we do have uh, sports scholarships. Um, we also have other uh, funding options, including in the musical arena. Uh, there are charitable scholarships. Um, they tend to be smaller amounts of money, but they are there to support, uh, particularly those working at athletic standard uh, who come and study with us. Uh, we have a large sports and wellness hub at Warwick that was completed last year. Um, and we are part of uh, the Bucks Leagues. So this is the British universities and colleges uh, sports leagues. So if you are performing at a high level and you want to compete with other universities, uh, these different varsity competitions that take place, uh, these different leagues that uh, exist, they exist across a, a wide range of different sports. So of course, football, rugby, uh, cricket, you know, some of the, the sports that um, are big in the UK. Uh, but also you can compete, you know, in things like badminton, volleyball. Um, there's about 65 different sports clubs that we have at Warwick. Um, it's also worth mentioning that if you haven't done a sport before and you're at the opposite end of things, um, universities really encourage you to get involved with these two and to try things out. So it could be that you want to try archery uh, or do more yoga or some of these sorts of different things. Um, there's often quite a wide variety of different sports available. Um, we have a sports team, so they're there to uh, provide coaching, uh, provide you know, athletic standard training, and we've got the Commonwealth team about to train with us at Warwick um, ahead of the Commonwealth Games very soon. But equally, if you want to do five-a-side on a Saturday, if you want to just do a, a rock-up-and-play session where you try things out, um, these are available too. Um, I don't know, Cecilia or uh, Caroline, if you want to add on sports? scholarships for sports 
um, it's just considered an, a, a, yeah, an undergraduate level, and I believe it's nothing that considerable, like uh, 500 pounds, a um, 1,000 pounds tops, uh, at least this was for last year. Again, each year we have different numbers. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid that for us, we do not offer that many um, yeah, scholarships. I don't know if our Caroline wants to add something. Yeah, I think our uh, situation is similar to um, to both of you, really. Um, so we do absolutely offer sports scholarships and we welcome applications from competitive athletes. I think where you are um, talking about that in your personal statement, again, it's good to frame it in the context of what that will mean for university life. So skills that you've developed, things like discipline, um so kind of talking about what you've done and your achievements in that way we do offer a number of sports scholarships every year i think in the uk in general it's very much a partial scholarship model including for sports so again where in the the us or north america generally you might see a kind of uh, a full sports scholarship that's really not very common in many universities in the uk and, and certainly not within the russell group um but we do offer partial scholarships we can also offer support with training we have a sports team as well we have some really great facilities at Manchester so yeah definitely encourage and, and welcome applications uh, from competitive athletes but just again kind of managing those those expectations in terms of what might be offered question but there is uh, still a few more in the chat so I see you still have a great energy um Carolina is asking uh, or Carolina I haven't seen uh, the career of journalism at UK universities. Does it exist or what's the name? Um, I can take this for, for Warwick, maybe just um, because we don't have journalism as an undergraduate degree, um, but we do have um, degrees that will allow, allow you to go into journalism. So it could be creative writing, it could be um, history or politics. Um, but when you get to master's level, we have a double degree with Monash University in Australia, which will give you politics and international studies with us, um, but then a journalism degree in Australia where it is taught. Um, so that's that's asked. Um, Caroline, what's your? Yeah, Manchester is, is similar. So we don't teach at undergraduate. We do offer related courses. So we've got English language, English literature, creative writing various different combinations of those kinds of subjects. You will find some UK universities do teach it as an undergraduate subject. So if you kind of know that that is the path that you want to go down um, and you want to go for the undergrad option straight away, then you can just go on the, the UCAS website and type in journalism in the subject search and it will show you all the different universities who do teach it as an undergrad subject. would be another question from Van Shika. I'm really sorry if I'm not pronouncing this name the first time I read it. It's a beautiful name. And I believe Van Shika is in Spain asking, do Manchester, Warwick and Southampton accept a Spanish A-level even if Spanish is your native language? Uh, yeah, so I can answer this for Manchester. We do accept native language A-levels. Um, so you can see on our undergraduate pages how we view those in, in the admissions process. But yes, we absolutely do accept them. Tells you about how we, how we consider native language A-levels. And with this, I believe we have answered most of the questions. Of course, there may be specific questions on programs where you want to apply to or um, your individual uh, curriculum that you would like to understand better how it will convert when applying to one of those universities. Um, I would like to thank everyone who was with us today. I would like to thank uh, most of all Stephen, Caroline and Cecilia for working uh, with us on a Saturday, although I'm sure it doesn't feel like work. Um, this job of helping students uh, find the best choice is just an incredible, an incredible job. And I believe you all miss being on the road. Um, so do we. So to everyone from the chat, some of you we have actually met uh, traveling. We have visited some of your schools and we do hope you're doing well. We do hope we'll have the wonderful opportunity to see you very, very soon. And until then, uh, please.
stop by our webinars, let us know what we can talk to you about and how can we help. And do keep in touch with Stephen, Caroline, and Cecilia from respectfully Warwick, Manchester, and Southampton on their wonderful universities. Thank you again, guys. Have a wonderful weekend. If you want to say a final word to our audience, I will turn my microphone off and then play once again the beautiful UK video to wrap up today's webinar. From myself, Tvetelina from SRT, I wish you a great day and welcome back soon. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys, for attending. Thank you for joining us today.